Hello, it's Brad Laurie, your Blockchain Brad, and today I'm honored to speak once again with Yuri Clairman. He is the CEO of BlocksRoute. If you don't know what that stands for, it's all about scaling solutions, specifically known for its layer zero uh, solution proposed for innovation on the blockchain. Yuri, thank you, mate, for coming on. I know you're very busy, and it's exciting to hear more about what BlocksRoute's doing. Thanks for having me, Brad. It's really good coming here again and seeing you and talking with you again. It's been a really long time since our previous talk. Mate, it's been too long, honestly. You are one very busy man right now, especially when you, you have a new family, you have a new baby, which is exciting, and you've made time outside of that. Um, but obviously, blockchain is the narrative of the day. Everyone's talking about how things are moving very rapidly. So let's get stuck into, once again, Blocks Route from the outset. Those who don't know, give us a quick rundown, Yuri, on you know, why scalability is the core of what you're trying to solve. Sure. So we're blocks route and we're called blocks route because what we do is we route blocks. Now, why do you need to route blocks, right? Blockchains propagate blocks by themselves all the time. Well, it turns out that the scalability problem of all blockchains, which is the number one problem, it requires a better solution for, route, for routing blocks. So to your question, what is the scalability solution? Um, I think the easiest solution is to say that blockchains and crypto aim to remove middlemen, right? The Bitcoin as the first one aims to remove financial middlemen, right? Credit right. card companies and banks and these kind of things. But credit card companies are processing something like 5,000 transactions per second today. On average, at peak, they process something like 300,000 transactions per second. And Bitcoin can only scale sorry, can only process three transactions per second. Ethereum right. process 10 transactions per second. Now, if Ethereum wants to process to do all the dApps, right, right, not only payments and micropayments, but also non-payment uh, transactions, you really need a lot of capacity. So what okay. the problem we're aiming to solve here is to enable and allow blockchains to do all the cool things that they want, right? To allow transactions and microtransactions and dApps. And specifically what we do, so you mentioned the layer zero solution. Mm. Well, people trying to solve the scalability, people had been talking about the scalability problem for what, four or five years now. And they end up saying something like, oh, there is a problem. Don't really pinpoint what that problem is. And then they try to throw solutions at it. So you'll see layer two solutions, right? Something on top of the blockchain, like lightning or sharding, which are very complex and hard to do, right? It's yes. trying to do X transactions off chain for every transaction on chain, or they try to do a layer one solution. Um, layer one is the blockchain itself. Why do a blockchain? Let's do a DAG. Let's do proof of stake or proof of work or this thing or that thing. Mm -hmm. But these aren't even the problem. Those, that's not the bottleneck. So whatever you do, that's not going to solve your problem. Wow, I found myself like going into all out full speed, like, um, 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 makes thinking. a lot of sense. Yuri, I want to just jump in because I really like the analogy of what you're saying. And well, to move it actually to an analogy, let's talk about the house. We talked about this when we last spoke over a year ago, but many people in the, if we use the analogy of a house, for example, uh, if blockchain is the house, you know, the architecture is the, the narrative of the day that which has the best architecture gets the best conversation gets the best hype blah 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 but in reality what you're saying is that very few of these architects are looking at the the cement are looking at the foundations looking at what the bedrock um, placement is for these houses and that's the question i wanted to ask you why is it that all these architects right now are so focused on either the um, the, uh, the infrastructure you know of this house or, you know, the prettiness of it, or perhaps, you know, building another um, layer on top of it. And why aren't they looking at the foundation? So, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a great analogy. I'm not sure what's going to be the answer. Let's think about it together. But the only mm. problem with this analogy is that it gives the impression that it's complicated, right? If you're just somebody who doesn't like you, like, you pretty much understand Bitcoin and pretty much understand like POS and POW, then you're like, well, there are underlying principles which I'm not aware of and so it must be very complicated and very hard which right. in fact it isn't so it just makes your question harder right it's kind of like why aren't people looking at it so let's think about it the two of us for a second together right okay. in a blockchain right it doesn't matter if it's proof of work or proof of stake or what's the protocol awesome. really permission per permissionless 
Yeah. It doesn't matter. Somebody out there mines a new block of transaction, or if it's a POS a validator, but creates a new block of transactions. And then he sends it to everybody else. And then right. somebody else on the other side of the world try to add another block on top of it, right? And the result is a long chain of blocks. That's the blockchain, right? right. Now, the simple problem at the cement level, at the foundation, as you called it, mm. is that the requirement is that if I create a block of transactions, I have to send it to everybody else fairly quickly. So the other guy on the other side of the world could mine his block on top of it. The other guy on the other side of the world cannot mine a new block before he heard of mine, right? He doesn't know which transaction were included, which weren't, what's now valid and invalid. So we can't add the next block until this block had reached him. So now because we don't know, neither in proof of work or in proof of stake, who's going to be the next one or it's going to change, etc. then the problem is every time somebody mines a block, it has to go to everybody else fairly quickly. If it goes slowly, then that guy on the other side of the world might create a competing block, right? In blockchain, we call it a fork or an orphan. Now you have two tips to the blockchain and eventually it will get resolved, right? The next block mine on top of one of them will make it longer than the other and everybody will converge to the longest blockchain. But you do need that block to get to everybody else to create a long blockchain and add block to the blockchain. Up until now, does that kind of make sense? It makes sense. And I think we can, it's harping again back to some of the more contemporary conversations of things like the internet, you know, in the sense that that's literally trying to interconnect. Um, if we use the analogy, for example, of the brain, I've used that before too, where you interconnect with nodes to light the brain up so that it has, you know, the, the perfect cognition and the cognitive capacity that it does have. In this sense, we could also liken it again to, to earth itself or the crust of the, of the earth. Because, you know, moving beyond that foundation from the house, as we're discussing now, I'm thinking that's not enough. It's really trying to utilize the whole landscape, to utilize the whole space we have so that all the different found, um, infrastructures, all the different um, architectures can actually interlink through the same seamless uh, platform that is Bloxrap. So that the conversations had between blockchains can be eased by, you know, the, what you're trying to build, which is underneath everything. So, so that's true. So what we're doing, and we didn't explain that to the audience because we, well, like, we have already talked about it, but, right. but what we do at Blockstart is really providing just really a faster internet for everybody. So if, you, if we just discussed about blocks that need to go to out there, to other people fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. If you want the blockchain to process a thousand times more transactions per second, then you need a thousand times larger blocks. And a thousand times larger blocks takes a thousand times longer to reach everyone, right? If I take a megabyte, it will go to everybody fairly quickly. If I take a gigabyte, then I have to send it to my peer. It takes a really long time. Then you send to the next peer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, um, to, to your point, what we're doing is exactly that, right? We are a faster internet. I want to compete with AT&T and Comcast, right? I'm not trying to do my own blockchain. But right. everybody who's doing a design out there to do a blockchain require a better infrastructure to allow their participant, right? If you are in Monero or Zcash or Neo or Ethereum or Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. Your nodes need to tell need to tell each other about new blocks, especially large blocks, really fast. And this is what we're really doing. Right. So going going back to your architecture kind of like analogy, Mm. this doesn't, it's not something very sophisticated. And to your original question, why aren't people looking at that? I don't have a really good answer for you. You would expect really professional people to take the time and understand what is the bottleneck that needs to be resolved. Now, I am a, my PhD for, oh, here's the thing, from the last time I spoke with you and by now, I already earned my PhD. So at the time, I was about to earn my PhD in computer networks. Now I have a PhD in computer networks. So for me, maybe for me, it's clearer than it is for other people, right? For me, it was when I got into this space, it was obvious Mm. that this is a problem that needs to be solved. Um, Maybe people, here's the answer for you. Crypto, crypto, the crypto system and the crypto community in general is filled with great cryptographers 
who are awesome and great and know more about crypto cryptography than I do. But mm -hmm. every problem that you're showing them, they will use a cryptography hammer and try to solve it with that. Right? Any problem in the world, they're like, oh, I will find a protocol which allows to do this in a trustless manner and like without it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I right. think that's the reason why people weren't paying attention. People came from the cryptographic discipline. This mm -hmm. is their school of thought. And so it wasn't instantly clear to them that what we really need is not a better protocol, but a better networking infrastructure. Right. And it makes a lot of sense. So, you know, again, you're fundamentally trying to uh, treat that problem or solve the problem of block propagation so that all of these different blockchain startups, these layer ones can actually perform better. So really you, you would be appeasing many of these new startups because you, you directly correlate, you directly align and you directly support. But I did want to ask you, why don't some of these layer one solutions just build their own? Why, why do they need that? And I also want to ask you about that term interoperability because we hear that thrown around a lot as well. And in your context, what does it mean? So, so to your first question, why don't, don't they, is why don't they deploy their own networking infrastructure, mm -hmm. something like BlocksRoute? Right. Well, I think they, I think they just, so first of all, there is like uh, um, economies, uh, economies of scale. So it's kind of like, it's better to have one system supporting all blockchains than one for each one. It just, it, it's just cheaper, but I don't think that's the real solution. Most of these people, if you have a great idea, right? You have a great idea for a DAP, or you now have a great idea of a new blockchain that needs to be deployed. And right. actually for you to convince me that you really need a new blockchain for that because you have a new consensus mechanism, you'll have a hard time convincing me because most things don't require a new blockchain. You right. only need a new blockchain because Ethereum and Monero and Bitcoin and a few like, and a few and Zcash, you can't use them because they're too expensive because they have reached the scalability limit. So you can't use them. So you do your own. Right. But most things in 99.9% .9 of the cases, they don't need their own blockchain. They want a token on a blockchain. They actually don't want to reinvent the wheel and do a consensus mechanism. All these things, they have to because the large blockchains can support them, right? Mm -hmm. I've been speaking with people doing really cool dApps who require, you know, there is small, like I'm, I'm speaking with a small company, not a really big one, mm -hmm. but they have something like over 50 million users and they require a few hundreds of transactions per second. Mm -hmm. And they're not that big, right? It's not that complicated to get like users and these, and they can't, operate on any of the existing blockchain. So they came to us because they wanted, they're like, oh, could you solve the scalability problem for us? We, we have to do our own blockchain. Not because we want to do our own blockchain, because we have to, because the large ones can't do that it. That makes a lot of sense. So basically the performance so, problem is still there, Yuri, for a lot of these blockchains. And they just got right, because, all the layers above being the dApps that want to use them. So let's talk about interoperability as well, because Again, we hear that discussion thrown around everywhere as the interconnective, that, that, that glue that binds many blockchains apparently, but it still doesn't really touch upon that TCP IP, that layer zero sort of area that you're touching upon. So, 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 so it, it, indeed it doesn't. I'm actually, it's not that I'm against interoperability, but I'm similarly to how you'll have to work hard to convince me that you need a new blockchain, right, for something. And it's not that I'm against of having a new blockchain, but usually there isn't a reason. It's just like a necessity because the existing blockchains can't support your volume. Similarly, I don't always see the value in interoperability, right? There is something like people say, oh, if you think of Bitcoin, Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, more like BTC or BCH or even BSV, which I'm not the largest supporter, but I'm, I'm agnostic. I'm supporting all blockchains and I don't care kind of like Likewise. who wins and who loses. I'm the same. But if they're aiming to be payments and you can think of Ethereum if, and I'm not sure, but if Ethereum is very good for dApps and non-payments of, of options but not very good for payments and it had to be seen like it, it remains to be seen i'm not sure that it's not good but you okay. can think oh then there, there should be some reason to combine between the two okay so i can see some reason for interoperability but do you really need to combine like i don't know a thousand different blockchains 
I don't think there is really a need for a thousand blockchains, hence not necessarily the need to connect them together. Mm. What we do, we really are like at the TCP IP layer, right? Really allowing smaller pieces of data to be propagated faster. So we do these things, like, so like we talked about it last time, right? We, mm. we use compression um, um, in order to send smaller pieces of data and we stream it a lot faster so we can propagate a thousand times larger blocks and we provide it to all, all blockchains out there. Um, but to your question about interoperability, it's not, honestly, I don't think there, it's directly related. Um, wow. um, I'm glad uh, that we decentralized. Ex <laughs> decentralized. Ex what was the hottest thing like last year? I think the the, the Dex, right? Decentralized exchanges and exchanges yeah. in general. What was yeah. the year before that? I don't remember. Well, just ICOs, right? And pretty much. So it's kind of like every every time there is this hot trend of something that oh, that's the biggest thing. Mm. Um, Paul Paul from um, Ed Wallet, who I really like, he said, "Well, no, no." Wallets is is the the, the exchange is twenty nineteen and he's to somewhat he's right about that. I actually think there's something to that. Right. But okay, like I'm not sure interoperability is what we're lacking. We're lacking great use cases and we're lacking and great I'm experience. So, I'm so glad you said that. So let's talk about the real context. We've learned a lot, you know, in these last few years or as we've seen this crypto casino play out. Now, if we use the analogy of an inverted pyramid for a moment, I want to do that because it's a great sort of analogy for the direction, I suppose, of the way blocks route and other systems may go because it's really about building out, building, building expansion of the system that you're trying to support in that you want, you said use case, you want the dApps to be the most pr prolific of the whole infrastructure because that's where the use case comes. You're meant to be the optimizer, the provider. And in between that, there are all the blockchains that sit within that potentially that can en enable and expand that real use case even grow further across the globe. So do you see evidence of that now since we've been talking, um, you know, since you've been building for over a year, um, do you see the evidence there of use case? So that's beyond the narrative. Of the theory? I, I had an interesting conversation, I think two days ago, I was giving a talk at Chicago um, Ethereum meetup here. And on the way back, I had a really interesting talk, of, you know, value proposition of blockchains as a whole, right? What, what is it good for? And I, th I, I think that a lot of time when, when people are talking about blockchains, they kind of like mix these like different value propositions, right? From store of value to li like frictionless tr um, transaction, not necessarily money, but transacting mm. into um, um, decentralization and the inability for somebody from the outside to affect it. So there are all of these different value propositions that the blocks are, that blockchains present. From my perspective, I see a lot of tools being built which will be used. I, I don't know if, to, if that's coming in like within a year or five years. When are we going to see the real use cases of the dApps reaching the market? But I see a lot of progress. So mm. with the block size debate and a lot of the focus of Bitcoin Core on home, like running home nodes, like non-mining nodes, like the focus was not on, oh, how do I make it the easiest thing for the person in the street in order exactly. to oh, pull out the, the, the phone and buy something with Bitcoin, right? It was no, how do I make sure that the random guy at, at like, like, like could run in his home computer, this, his node and stay up to date? It's a, where I'm not really sure if somebody can't even transact on Bitcoin, right? If Bitcoin... Right. And the funny thing is, right at the beginning, Yuri, sorry to interrupt, but really the narrative initially wasn't even about, you know, can it internally scale? It was actually, can we be anonymous? It was a narrative that was almost misguided in that, you know, people were trying to jump on the bandwagon of some sort of means of circumventing authority. And, but the reality is when people understood blockchain more, it was actually, it's actually quite a transparent system it's not true necessarily true it's, system you you you're right the, the cool thing about and again I, I i personally i love bitcoin right there's plenty of room for blockchains to do very exciting things but right. bitcoin is it the killer app like the idea of like um, um capped amount of deflationary money i don't know i find it very very compelling um 
But yes, people were thinking, oh, this is going to allow me to kind of like hide and all these kind of things. It really does a poor job about it, mm-hmm. but it does protect you if you are somewhere um, um, that you do, like the fact that you have a lot of money doesn't necessarily protect you because the, 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 the government or the, some entity can seize your funds. The idea that nobody can seize your funds that's something that I, which I find very compelling. Oh, I, 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 also, I also like the borderless nature. I like the way in which it enfranchises people to have more autonomy. All those things are fantastic. And also the potential for a store of value or whatever it does evolve to be. I like that plasticity of the, the Bitcoin uh, core construct. But moving back to you, though, you're very different. Your premise is about building out the potential for business. And I mean that in a really genuine sense, because let's get real for a moment. You've moved into a security token model specifically because you're gearing up to be, let's let's face it, uh, somewhat centralized. Let's discuss that a little bit more. Even though you're a proponent of decentralized technologies, the business isn't. Right. So how does that see the whole model? That's that's an excellent point to be made. So I, I would like actually to point out that people who say, oh, everything is decentralized, aren't very familiar with the technology stack that they're using, right? The internet, their internet service provider, their ISP, that they're using their link, that's a centralized entity that's sending their bytes out there. Right. Most of the data in the world today passes through the data center of Google, of Amazon, of Facebook. These are centralized entities. So um, even a fun fact, right, is that most people running nodes are probably... Um, 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 running in a centralized kind of, No, no, but l- like they're breaking the rules of their contract with their ISP not to run a server. Theoretically, they should only right. be the client. No, not that I care, right? I don't mind at all. But mm. the idea is that the infrastructure, right? Somebody owns the fiber links and the, like, the, 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 the wires underneath the sea and all these kind of things. Somebody owns them. It's not decentralized. Not everything is decentralized, even though we want it to. What we want is to utilize that without placing any trust in it. So even though somebody controls it, we don't want that person to be able to censor or to discriminate or to seize funds or to do any of the nasty things. Right. So when we built Blockstrout, our, our idea, the core thing was to say, can we build a better network infrastructure than what's out there? So A, we're faster. But let's build it in such a way that we are intentionally blind to the data that we're sending, what it contains, where it comes from, where is it going. We don't know these things intentionally. We built it in such a way that we don't know these things Mm. and we can't know these things. So we cannot discriminate based on that. So the idea was to, if I can improve on the existing like, like um, um, infra- network infrastructure, then I feel good about myself. I don't feel that I'm doing anything wrong by going and say, oh, rather than using that network infrastructure, which is centralized and somebody owns it, use this one, which is centralized, but it is provably neutral. I cannot, even if I really want to, I can't discriminate and I can't censor. Now right. to your comment on 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 our security token, we don't have a utility token. You don't need to use Blockstart. Blockstart is for free. Everybody could use it. It scales yeah. all blockchains. Open source. We have a business. It's, it's open source. And we start with the gateways open source. We're going to open source everything eventually. Um, but the idea is that we have a business model which allows us to make some money. Yeah. And we're going, we, we have a security token that we allow people who are interested. If you think Blockstart is a great idea, and you want to be part of it, then the revenues, rather than going to us, they go to the token holders. So as the starting point, we are the token holders. So we get the revenues and that's our revenue stream. But if you would like to invest in us the same way that you would invest in Apple or in Amazon or any other share, Mm. or slightly different because there you might get a piece of the profits. Here you're getting a piece of the revenues. You don't care about our expenses and our costs. But the idea is, if you own 1% of our tokens, that 1% of the revenues will go to you. And we do this because 
honestly, I would like everybody to invest in Blockshout. Do you know, I, I, I assume you read Catch-22. So is yes. a, there is a point there where it's like, everybody has a share in the syndicate. I want everybody to have a share in the syndicate. So everybody has an incentive to use Blockshout. Blockshout scales all blockchain. So I don't want people to feel afraid of it or it's kind of like, oh, that's kind of like a problematic system. Mm. No, everybody are invested in it. And so everybody will be happier if, let's say, if you are into just throwing a, if you're in Ethereum mm. and you would like Ethereum to use Blockshout, but also you will actually benefit from it. So we want buy-in from users and from miners and from investors and really everybody across the entire crypto ecosystem in order to align everybody's incentive. Right. Everybody should be very happy about blockchain scaling all blockchains. That's kind of my take. And Yuri, that kind of benign, that kind of benevolent thinking, you know, that really does extend beyond just uh, capitalizing and uh, being and profiteering from this new technological innovation. And I, I want to I, I, you know, discuss this. I don't further. think so. It's, it's, it's not benevolent, right? The idea is that it just makes sense, right? If I'm... It, well, it's, it's, well, let's, I'm, let's talk about it though for a second, because it could be, because if you stuck with the model of, of uh, precluding people from access, then that things wouldn't change. We would see the new infrastructural technology emerge um, as a centralized entity, but preclude people like the, you know, the everyday investor from accessing. And that's where the benevolence can be uh, relevant because the technology itself affords an open door. And that's what you're providing. You could literally do the opposite and privatize this so that you didn't allow that access in. Because really what people need to understand about you, I think, is that you are a new technology. You know, you're leading the way in a new infrastructural solution that is literally going to have monetized value, units of account, real uh, proof that you can produce revenue. Now, how you open that to the people is up to you. And you've done that in a way that lets us in. I, I, I agree it's a um, move for the better, right? It's a good thing, right? You don't, I don't say, but, but at least for me, benevolent means something altruistic. And it's not right. altruistic, right? Okay. The idea is that, like, how does Bitcoin work? How do blockchain? By aligning the incentives, right? Miners follow the longest blockchain because this is how they will make the most profit. I make, like, I would like everybody to participate because then it's good for them. But mm -hmm. it's also good for me in the long term. So maybe in the short term, it doesn't play in my favor. But in the long term, I want to literally, like, it's going to play in my favor. So right. it is... Well, uh, you know a what? force of good. You really I, I appreciate I, I your honesty. I really do. Because what you're saying is it's still a, a capitalistic movement. You still want to make money. You still want this to be a business. So let's talk about that. How is the business going? How are you building right. in terms of those um, connections with the blockchain? So, and beyond that, the connection with the dApps and the money related to all of that. So let's start. For, so if somebody were, were to go now, so I'm going to give you a short update in a second, but if somebody were to go to our previous conversation, mm. he would go and see me about a year ago or something like that, saying how we're, the first thing that we're going to do is to show our POC, our proof of concept, right. how we take the Bitcoin code and deploy a network and use blocks route to show we're doing a very high volume of transaction per second, thousands of transactions per second, because only the network layer is the bottleneck. Now, here we are a year later, and we're actually in a week from now in New York, I'm going to release these results. Um, but it took me longer, significantly longer than I expected. And the reason for that is that when we, like our plan was to do two things at once. One is show the POC, show that it actually works, right? Show that it scales blockchain. And at the same time, develop the product itself, deploy the network of servers all around the world, which propagate blocks, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out while working on the POC, it's very hard to understand and see what's happening. If something doesn't work in the peer-to-peer -peer network, if something breaks, except for the log files of like Bitcoin nodes, which doesn't give you that much, you have no idea. You're, you're really flying blind. Mm. So after working on it for months, we decided, oh, we're, we need to build an infrastructure which monitors what happens at each point at every single moment. So we can see, oh, he received the block at this time. Right. 27 million microseconds afterwards, he processed that thing and he sent it at this time and 13 milliseconds, it was arrived with the other peer, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Building all that infrastructure, we realized, well, we might as well combine it with the product. So rather than do the two things 
in parallel, we realized we have to, like, it doesn't make sense. So mm-hmm. it took us longer than we anticipated, but now we actually have, and this brings me to answer, where are we right now? Mm. Blocks route is in production, okay? There is already, and for those who don't, don't know what that means, that means that there is actually a live network which is always on. Now, AWS has like 99.99999% availability. We're not there yet. We're in the high percentile. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. It's, right. You need to develop the procedures. How do you upgrade the entire network while it's still operating? These kind of things. There's a lot to be done there, but it's already like, okay, we're in a good position already. It's actually, people don't know it, but it's connected to Bitcoin Core mainnet and Bitcoin Core testnet and Bitcoin Cash mainnet and testnet and Ethereum mainnet and Ethereum multiple testnets. And it's supporting all these blockchains in parallel. So Mm -hmm. where we are right now is that we have Blocksroute in production. We're going to launch Blocksroute either at the end of the product itself, at either at the end of June or at the beginning of July. So in a month or two from where we are today, Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's literally right now. It's already like, like we're there. Mm-hmm. What we have been working very hard lately is our miner test. We went out to miners and we told them, we have a value proposition for you for the short term and for the long term. In the long term, we want to allow you to do thousands of transactions per second. So even if each user pay 10 times less fees than they're paying right now, you will make 100 times more fees in total because you'll make 1,000 times more transactions per second. Wow. So that's the long-term value. For, and, and we offer this service to miners for, for free. So we offer them this and, as the long-term value proposition. Mm-hmm. And then we tell them, but we know nobody cares about long-term value proposition. It's kind of like, for that, come back in five years. Mm-hmm. The short-term value proposition for miners is we tell them, Connect to Blocks Route, and you will be able to hear about blocks faster immediately. Now, for a miner, if you're a miner and you hear about the block sooner, you can start mining on top of it faster mm-hmm. or earlier, and you make more money, right? Rather than wait to waste two seconds as you mine on the previous block because you haven't heard about the new block, now you hear about it faster, so you can start mining right. sooner and literally. It's money in the pocket for miners. Right. So we have been working with BTC.com and F2 Pool and Raw Pool and like all and all the big Ethereum miners. So Eat Miner and like really Spark Pool. Literally everybody who's everybody. Yeah. So right now, if you'll go to the Bitcoin Cash testnet, like we wanted to test on something, Bitcoin Core currently at one megabyte isn't really providing us. We we offer scales and Bitcoin Core don't want to scale on chain. So we actually broke. So if you look right now on Bitcoin Cash Testnet, you will see a lot of 32 megabyte blocks out there yes, being I'll propagated. That's us. About this actually. So. So, 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 so it's funny. We actually broke the block explorer of Bitcoin.com. So their block explorer for the, uh, for the mm-hmm. testnet. So it's kind of like, okay, we found bugs for them, I guess, um, because they weren't ready for it. Right. Um, but so, so, so we are seeing really good results with that. Um, in two weeks, we'll do the same with Ethereum, likely on mainnet. So we're working with all these miners so they can measure how much faster are they hearing about blocks and how much more money they could be making. Right, and it makes so, a lot of sense. So really, you're the optimizer. You're that speed optimizer for these blockchains. And essentially, <laughs> you're, you're testing them right now to see if they can cope with your tech. And that's the big question, though. Are they ready for you? Because if we talk, revert back to that, you know, inverted pyramid concept and construct, you know, we want to see the applications, we want to see the use case, but for that to happen, everything beneath needs to be ready. Are they ready for you, Yuri? Are they ready for blocks route? So here's the nice, so, so this is real world deployment, right? We deploy it and things grow, right? Oh, some, that node went down and that gateway fell and now this, so, so this is, and, and we expect these kind of things. But miners have a strong incentive here and incentives go a really long way making people ready. So miners, especially the large pools, they are very technical. They have really good people working on their end. So we run it and then something break and we pinpoint, oh, what broke and why did it break? And we fix it on our end or on their end, etc. So in terms of scalability, soon enough, we're going to go out there and like, like, um, I'm going to make a presentation in Token Summit in New York Blockchain Week on the 16th of May. 
Okay. And I'm going to a show. Really, guys, the only bottleneck is the network layer. The only one. Yeah. And I'll show proof for that because I'll show how I took Bitcoin and ran it. And so it's a transaction per second. Mm. And once we're there, I'm going, and the message to all blockchains is if you want to scale, you don't need a new consensus because the consensus doesn't matter. That's not the bottleneck. You don't need a new mechanism. All these things, that's not, you're looking at the wrong things. And honestly, Take a, lot of, and a lot of that is also part of the narrative that we hear, the blockchain bullshit. A lot of that's just made up so they can sell the newest big, you know, big hot thing that, you know, is, is, makes money in a very short period of time, but then gradually dies. So in that respect, so, what you're saying so, is more honesty with what we really need at the bottom, the true bottleneck solution is, is really what you're trying to solve. Yeah, a, yes. Now, going back to the benevolent to be like piece from before, even here, I'm going to go to everyone and I'm going to say, oh, I solved the scalability problem for all of you guys. And everybody are going to use Blockstrout for the reason you just mentioned, right? If you're a small blockchain like project, you want to go to your investors and tell them, oh, I can do a thousand transactions per second. Okay, so I'm not worried about people not using me and these kind of things. Exactly because of that, because people need that, they want it for their own end. Yep. And I am agnostic, like Blockstrout is protocol agnostic, it just support everybody. So we, are, we have the best people in the world working on building the blockchain network infrastructure that we need, the blocks right. the BDN, well, blockchain let's distribution talk, network. Let's talk now, now though, Yuri, about how you make money because you, the infrastructure okay. literally for the infrastructure. That's the interesting part. You are the infrastructure for infrastructure. And we want to know for those who are going to support you as an investment and we can use that word with you, which is refreshing. How is it that you're going to, or show the growth economically, the, the viability, the revenue, the potential. So, of really scaling so the, the potential is nice. Okay, the idea is the following. Blocks route, nobody has to pay blocks route, but we provide everybody with some amount of free capacity, like 100 transactions per second, everything goes through blocks route. Mm -hmm. But the gateways that we give to other people, they will enforce rules. So we can't enforce anything, right? We are provably neutral. Mm -hmm. But they will enforce rules. So the more, if you pay a fraction of your mining fee, so let's say 10% of your mining fee, 5% of a cent, a tiny payment to blocks route, the gateways will allow you to do, to get more bandwidth. So there is some free bandwidth, but for transactions that pay blocks route, there is additional bandwidth. And in fact, the more of these transactions you include, the more free bandwidth we will give you. So if you're a user, a user making a transaction, if you pay blocks route, when that goes to the miner, the miner doesn't have to fit you in that smaller capacity of the free transaction. He can include you in the extra capacity. And in fact, he will that will allow him to include other transactions that don't pay us. So even if you don't pay him the regular fee, let's say a miner usually require one cent mm -hmm. for, for, the, for your transaction and you pay him just half a cent and to blocks route 5% of a cent. If that goes to the miner, he will look at it and he will say, Oh, well, you know what? That doesn't pay me the one cent I usually take, mm -hmm. but that's not instead of these transactions. It's in addition to them. And in fact, if I include this transaction, I can include more of these transactions that don't pay blocks route. So we are a fee reduction service. If you pay blocks route, the miner would require a smaller fee from you. So the right. idea for us going to the business model, we're going to get a tiny payment from every transaction, let's say 5% of a cent. Mm -hmm. But our end game, when we're supporting all transactions and microtransactions and dApps, et cetera, we're talking about 200, 300, 400,000 transactions per second. But so that's the end game. But even if we're talking mid game, right at 30 transactions per second, if you do the math of 5% of a cent times 30,000 transactions per second times 31 million seconds in each year, you're at something like half a billion dollar per year in revenues. Right. And so that really the potential for you to make the, money is immense in the, in the, in the yeah, I'm, th that's the one thing I'm really not worried about. And this is why we offer people, this security token. So we're aiming to make billions of, of, of dollars. That's what like we create so much value. 
And the nice thing, we actually give away most of the value that we create. We, cre we give away 99.9% .9 of the value to, that we create to the users who are going to pay lower fees and to the miners who are going to make l bigger fees because they're making such high volumes of transaction per second. Right. And we're capturing just that 0.1% of the value that we create. Got it. But that's enough to put us like somewhere where we're very happy with yes. to the point that we're like, oh, other people are going to want to invest in it too, right? This right. is where we're doing our security token. Okay. If you want a piece of that thing, if you own 1% of our token, you'll get 1% of these payments. And you, you make a good so point. Kind of you, you make a good uh, a place for the future as well in terms of revenue, because obviously you're really at the beginning now of building this out for the real world. But give us an example of the pipeline that's lined up right now to start to interact at that level. Are we even ready for that yet where we're starting to see more of these transactions really start to increase so that you're taking that small you know, piece of the transactional value and building out your own revenue? What's the current, and if we looked at your books now, what would they look like? So our books, uh, I, I can tell you, uh, here's what I can share, okay? I can share with you that there is this company who approached us mm -hmm. and they're not that big and they already require hundreds of transactions per second. Right. They aim to go much further than that. But that's, that's, that's not Apple, right? So that's like five orders of magnitude smaller than that's a me like small, medium company that does a thing. The big, you know, the FANG companies, each one of them require tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Um, just if, if you're thinking um, Alibaba, you're talking Amazon, like these guys. So I can't be very transparent regarding who we're speaking with and what they want to do, et cetera, et cetera. Most of it because I'm sort of like I've signed NDAs that don't allow me to say any of it. Right. Um, but I'll tell you this, the problem isn't that there aren't, the problem isn't that there aren't people who want to use it. Okay, up until now we had this grassroots movement. It's fine, it's awesome, it's great, but it's when big companies hop in and they're like, oh, I'm deploying a system. I don't know, I've seen, so there's definitely JPM, right? Uh, J J JP Morgan coin. And there's definitely, well, Louis Vuitton is now doing a thing, right? With, with using permission blockchain, these kind of, like so real the number of trying to do this, they're taking this seriously. They are taking it seriously. Their revenues are sometimes large. Their, re, their yearly revenues are sometimes bigger than the entire crypto market cap. Okay, mm -hmm. like, like crypto market cap is currently $180 billion. You see companies of trillions and, and hundreds of, of billions who are interested in doing these kind of things. So the problem isn't, Will we have demand? That was never the problem. It's mm. about providing that, hopefully with nice tools, right? So it's not just a consumer and a nice app to buy with Bitcoin. But if you're a company, you want to deploy something, you want it to work out of the box without you having to understand how this whole blockchain thing works. You just want to utilize it for your own good. Right. If that kind of makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Now, Yuri, let's get cut to the chase with regard to when people can start to access this SEO. When can people start to, from the public side of this, because obviously that's the whole point of this, is to allow people to have access to this in an open so, exchange. When so, will we be able to do it? 2019, this year. Okay. Okay, give us some more. I want more than that, brother. When, when is this plan? You took okay, I'll, 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 tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell you... Um, um, our plan okay? okay what what we really want is to do a reg a plus for those okay. who don't know there is reg a plus is to allow everybody not only accredited investors but everybody to invest but in order to do that you need to get approval from the sec and that takes time you, you know, and that so we're going to so, like, like in in very soon we're going to submit our 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 okay. request to, to the our application to the SEC, um, but we don't know wh when we're going to hear from that. So right. it's likely that in 2019, it might be only open for people from outside the US and accredited investors in the US, mm -hmm. not because it's what we want, it's because we're forced to buy regulation. Mm -hmm. And it might be that in 2020, everybody could buy in. Uh, and, and it I, might I be- really appreciate your, I really appreciate your transparency there because Obviously, the US is still trying to work through, they have other regs as well, not just the A+. 
But these kinds of approaches they're taking is just simply to make sure that, that it protects the interests of the investor. So it's only a matter of time, I would imagine, that US does get on board. But it's great to see that much of the world already is with the Reg A Plus now. And you're using it. You're going to open this up. And you're saying 2019 could well and truly be. I, I, so, so I want, like, 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 I actually want everybody to be able to invest in that. I'm going to follow the rules to the letter because mm. from the, we're doing a security token. We're not a utility token pretending to be a, not a security and these kind of things. Right, exactly. If I could, like, if I could, I would do a Reg A plus like in 2019 and be like, I'll be super happy with it. If I can't, and it might be that I'll have to wait, mm. then it might be a Reg D this year, et cetera. Like that's, that's right. legal thing that we don't really have option there. We just follow the steps until we get approval. Makes sense. But mate, I'm really glad that, to know that you are following through. Can I ask you one more thing though? Why did you decide to do the tokenized approach? Because you could have gone down a different route as well. You could have done just straight equity. You didn't have to have a token. What made you want to embed that into your whole model? So that, that, that's a really great question. The idea is really the following. If we make, we create so we create so much value, okay? Like really, we scale all blockchains. We move to thousands of transactions per second, right? But if we give away all that value and we capture 0.1% and we're making billions of dollars, that would make people hate us. That will make us the banksters and the rent seekers and the leaders and whatnot. Even though we give away almost all the value that we create, we capture a tiny fraction of it. Mm. So. This, in the crypto space, it's a problem. It's a real problem. I want everybody to be very happy with Blockstart and see that it's in their best interest. Right. By using a security token, we allow everybody to invest in Blockstart. So it's not that just money pouring from people to Blockstart. No, anybody can invest in Blockstart if they want to, if they think it's a good business. And it's just like money circulating. Okay, so it's kind of like, okay, it's going to the holders of BLXRs. And if Brad, if you are a holder of BLXRs, you get a portion out of that. Mm. So it aligns everybody's incentive. If you are in Ethereum and you want Ethereum ecosystem to utilize blocks out and increase um, the gas limit, etc., cetera, mm. you're very happy about it. It gives you so much value. And you're also making a bit of money out of it from the side. Right. Okay, so it makes more sense. It's in your incentive. So it's really about aligning everybody's incentive. It's also, it's also that you're supporting crypto. You've not literally cryptography for a start. You're aligning the interests of blockchain and crypto and you're supporting the ecosystem that is, is already trying to find its way through this very convoluted time where we see all, all kinds of interests from speculators through to technologists through to uh, innovative thinkers, that there's a lot going on. You want to push forth into that business domain and make crypto real, make use cases real. So it's been really interesting to talk to you. If you'd like to know more for all those who are listening, you certainly can go and engage with all the different media that's available, all the different social channels, social media channels as well. As Yuri said, some of the big points to just to rehash, you can go and explore some of the things like the neutral position, understanding that they're focused on being the blockchain infrastructure for blockchains. There's a lot going on. Layer zero is the, the, the concept, concept we talked about before, but now it's really moving on to a means of business, trying to get real on the blockchain so that things can start to happen and start to scale. And you also, as an entity, can make money and do it in a way where you announce that you're a security legitimately. So Yuri, it's been really cool to catch up. You've moved a long way since we spoke last. Is there anything you want to say to finish off to the people, to give them some sort of confidence that you're doing some real, real deal stuff, not blockchain bullshit? Um, so, so first of all, I would like to think it's really great talking with you again. It's been a long while and I'm glad we got a chance. Um, I'll say that we didn't really cover in depth what is it. So, so there is a lot of fluff in this space, right? Yeah. So if you want to understand what, what Blockstrout is doing, there are two things worth. If you go to Blockstrout.com, we have like a two-minute video explainer, which is dead simple. So, oh, I just go there. I see a two-minute video. And oh, now I kind of got it what they got. Right. Um, as I, me I mentioned earlier that I did an Ethereum meetup, um, um, I think, Early or late last week, I think it was a good one. You could probably yeah, find it easily. It's on Twitter. You can go and check it out. So, so, if you go and check it out, I think that was a fairly good one that captures where we are and what is it that we do. Because I don't want people to invest in us because oh, Uri throws tons of fluff on on on, on everything. Right. Fig figure out what is it that we do. It makes so much sense, even if you're not super technical. If it should be 
accessible and, and, and easily understood for everyone. So I, I encourage everybody who is interested, go and check it out what is it that we're actually doing rather than buy into the hype. Absolutely, mate. And always, you're all someone who represents, you know, the, the true technology. You've just finished your PhD. You, 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 your, your family's expanding too. So it's nice to see that you're not just doing technology, but you're also living life. I wish you all the very best, Yuri. You're a good guy. You're trying to do things and you're trying to clean this space up as well. And that's also why you're moving into this security domain so that people can own a chunk of blocks route for the future, not just simply speculate in that utility model for hope of something more. Uh, again, I hopefully we'll catch up again, mate, to see how you evolve in the next few months because you're moving fast now. I'm looking forward to seeing all the apps, all the DAPs, all of the blockchain start to really voice your value. But until then, mate, you know, congratulations for your success so far and your team. And we'll talk to you hopefully soon. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Really good connecting with you again, Brad. Likewise, mate. Take care.